السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت باركت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد أما بعد إخواني We started last week with an introduction towards studying the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we mentioned the benefits and why we should study the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we mentioned 12 points, if not 13. Was it 12 or 13? It was 12 points. And the first of them was what? Why do we study? Or why should we study? Why should we invest our time and effort in learning about the life history of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? We said the reason number one is what? Because it helps us immensely, in fact, to understand uh, the Qur'an in the proper way. It helps, it helps us understand the texts of the Qur'an. Very good. Now, number two. It helps us to understand the sunnah, meaning the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the proper understanding because you may get a hadith but you don't know when did this event occur or what are the reasons behind it so the seerah it gives you the light it sheds light on that huh? it sheds light on that yes and number three the seerah it helps us Learn the proper aqidah, the proper belief of a Muslim. What does the Muslim believe? When you learn the seerah of the Prophet وسلم, automatically you're learning what does the Muslim believe. Because the seerah practically shows you what the Prophet وسلم, did and what he avoided and what he told people to avoid. Huh? So it shows you the aqidah. Number four, why do we study the seerah of the Prophet so that we can follow his way? Because he, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is the greatest role model for us. He is the, is the greatest exemplary for us. He is the greatest personality for us and celebrity. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he made it a command, an order for us to follow his way. For us to follow his way. But we said it's not for everybody though, right? It's for who? It's for who? For those who have hope in Allah. If you have hope in Allah, if you have hope in that day, Allah will forgive you and enter into paradise and save you from the hellfire. Then the only way you can achieve that is not just by hope, saying, yeah, I'm a Muslim, I'll be saved. No. It's by doing what? Following the Prophet وسلم, taking him as your example. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهُ الْيَوْمَ الْآخَرِ That is Surah Al-Ahzab, verse number. Huh? No. Surah Al-Ahzab is chapter number what? 33, verse number 21. Very good. So if you have hope in Allah, you have hope in the last day, you'll be saved. You have to follow the way of the Prophet ﷺ. How do you know the way of the Prophet ﷺ? You study his seerah. You study his seerah. Now, reason number five. What is the fifth benefit of studying the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ? 
and this we said it goes with the previous one so we can love so we can know how to love the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and why we should love the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because you can't love someone without knowing him or her you can't love something without knowing it it's impossible it's impossible you understand so we need to love the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam why because number one, we just mentioned to follow him you can't follow someone if you don't love him it's impossible and when you love someone uh, you impulsively you follow them even without knowing sometimes the way they talk the way they walk the way they dress the way they conduct themselves because you love the person so when you love the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam you go back to number 4 you'll follow him and also because loving the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a great part of iman in fact the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said what in the hadith narrated by al bukhari la yu'minu ahadukum hatta kuna habba ilayhi min waladihi wa walidihi wa nas ajma'in none of you can be a true believer until i become it, until i become more beloved to him than his parent and his children and everybody else you know this is easier said than done like we said last week for those of you who are coming on wednesday we are reading kitabul iman in sahih al bukhari we went through this chapter the hadith of umar radiyallahu anhu umar who allah has told us through his prophet this is a man who has pure real iman he is going to jannah already one day umar radiyallahu anhu is walking with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and because they love him so much and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam loves him so much he's they are holding hands they are walking and umar he says to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says ya rasulullah innaka la habb an-nas ilayya illa nafsi he says oh messenger of allah you are the most beloved person to me except myself except myself and that's the problem most of us we have we might say we love someone but when it comes to our self indulgences and our self desires what we want no and that's the definition of the word selfish all about you first you understand that's the definition of the word selfish selfish does not mean you don't love others no you love others but you come first which is wrong islamically you're supposed to love for others like how you love for yourself unless it's things of doing good then you have to rush to do good yourself but also you have to love for others to do the same good but generally speaking for anything we are you as humans were created like that and this is one of the tests of life one of the test of iman that allah says to us you can't be a real believer until that part of your heart which is stored for love allah has to be number one and then from the human beings has to be the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam after the prophet has to be your parents or the sahaba so umar umar is walking with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says to him ya rasulullah oh mr of allah i love you more than everybody except myself umar had more than two wives a bunch of children his brother zaid ibn al khattab umar radiyallahu anhu most of you have never heard of zaid zaid ibn al khattab the brother of umar he became muslim before umar and he was killed as a shaheed umar used to say he is better than me he was better than me as a muslim and that tells you enough so umar has all these people in his family who was his wife who knows huh who was his brother in law huh no 
Sa'id ibn Zayd, Ahsant. And Sa'id ibn Zayd is one of the ten greatest companions. You have to know these names, Ikhwan. Sa'id ibn Zayd, Ibn Amr ibn Nufayl, is one of the greatest companions, one of the ten were granted paradise. And his father, we'll discuss him, inshallah, very soon. He never saw the Prophet sallam, as a prophet of Islam, but he saw him before Islam. And his father was like the Prophet sallam, he never worshipped idols. And he never ate from the meat the Arabs used to slaughter for the idols and their false gods. He would say, no. Who gave you this sheep or this goat or this camel? They would say, Allah. Who gave you the grass it fed on and the water it fed on it drank on? They would say, Allah. He said, then why don't you slaughter it for Allah? You slaughter it for the idols. I don't eat this. And the Prophet sallam, he said, he's going to a good place. He was on the Milla of Ibrahim, which was left. That was his father. Sa'id ibn Zaid now. He is the brother-in-law of Umar. Now imagine this is your brother-in-law, one of the ten greatest, greatest men. Granted paradise already. Someone you get a love. So Umar says, You are most beloved to me, Ya Rasulullah. Accept myself. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, La Ya Umar, no. Meaning, no, you have not become a believer then. Not yet. La Ya Umar, he said, not yet. Until I become more beloved to you than your own self. And Umar he thought about it. And he said, Al-an, Ya Rasulullah, now. That is true. Now, you are number one. More than myself. And that is how they were, and that is why today, uh, in English we use the word, we sing their praise. We glorify them and venerate them. That is why Allah praised those men. They were ready to put their bodies and their lives and give everything for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Practically. Practically. That is why they got the status they got. So, when you learn the seerah, we get to love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That was number five. What is number six? You get to love the companions. Just like we see this short story. Sa'id bin Zaid, Umar radiallahu anhu. You get to know about these great men. These are the people who they're always featuring in the seerah because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, just like every other human being, you're not an island. You have to live with people. And he lived with people. In fact, he's the definition of how to live with people. So you get to love those great men. Why should we love them? Why should we love the Sahaba? And we say the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet sallallahu meaning the generation he lived with. What is the definition of a Sahabi? Who knows? When does someone qualify to be called a Sahabi, a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? No. 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 All of you are correct, but you're missing something. He mentioned for one part, one part. He mentioned two parts. That's the last part which is missing. If you get off the wall and come close, I will take your answer. Mm. Yes, Ibrahim. No. He mentioned that already. Yes, Abdurrahim. No. No. All of these are right, by the way, but that's not the definition of a Sahabi. If you say someone who met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Lahab met the Prophet or not, and Abu Jahal, and they're in the deep hell pits of the hellfire. La. What if someone was mute, he couldn't speak? Is he a Sahabi or not? What's the definition of a Sahabi? That is why you gotta appreciate, see this knowledge behind me? These are things our scholars precisely defined. 
يا سبحان الله أحسن that is the last part someone who saw the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم believed in him and he died in that state as a Muslim three things someone who saw the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم believed in him so he had to be a Muslim and died as a Muslim you can't just say someone who saw the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم as you know that is out how many people saw him they never believed in him they're not sahabis or he saw him but believed in him what if he changed after and he died as a non-muslim because there were some people who did that I'll bet it was very few but there was some yeah they saw the prophet وسلم, they believed in him then they left Islam when the prophet وسلم, died they said he died the religion is over they are not called sahabi but someone who met him and that is the proper definition whether they not saw him because if he's blind is he a sahabi or not yes he is Someone who met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they say even for one minute he met him and he believed in him and he died as a Muslim. That is the definition of a Sahabi. The question will come, what if someone saw him but he was not a Muslim yet? When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died, now he became a Muslim. Is this a Sahabi? answer is yes he is a sahabi because technically he saw the prophet sallallahu sallam and then he believed in him and died upon islam that is why we say the greatest sahabi the greatest companion of the prophet sallallahu sallam is who isa ibn maryam alayhi salam jesus the son of mary does he fit the criteria Someone who saw or met the Prophet وسلم, believed in him and then died as a Muslim. Yeah, he didn't die yet. So he's still alive. Okay, did he meet the Prophet وسلم? Yes. Did he believe in him? Yes. Will he die as a Muslim or not? Yes, so who's better, Isa or Abu Bakr? Isa is the greatest companion. Exactly, he's a prophet. But technically, he's a companion. Because when he comes back, he is going to rule by this sharia of the Prophet. He is not coming back with the gospel, the Injil. That's done. He is going to rule by the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. That's the definition of a Sahabi. So, this great man, when we learn the seer of the Prophet, they are always featuring. And everyone played their part, subhanAllah. There's some people, you hear their name once, that's it. And he's going to Jannah. There's some people who don't even know their names. And they're people of Jannah. But you gotta, you gotta love these men. Like which one? You've heard me saying this story a few times. No? You never heard his name. I'm saying someone you don't know his name. Questions after. Write it down. Before you forget, you write it down. <coughs> so I told you last week you come with your books and your pens or your gadget and write. The hadith when the Prophet ﷺ was sitting, the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, What? Yadhul fikum al an rajlu min ahl al jannah. Right now there's a man who's going to enter, he's a man of paradise. Allahu Akbar. Abdullah bin Umar said, we are all amazed. Some, this is something great. To hear someone is a man of paradise already. And he's walking on earth. He said, so we looked. He said, and this man came. He had a big beard. And he looked at it, just made wudu. He said, mashallah. The second day, they're sitting with the Prophet wasallam, same place. In the masjid, and he said, a man from the people of paradise will enter. And the same man came through. Third day, next day, same thing. Abdullah bin Umar, they say, what? I need to find what's the reason. How is this man going to Jannah already? You know the story, right? And he followed him. He said, you know, I don't have a place to stay. Can I stay with you? He wants to investigate. Look how they were so passionate about Jannah. 
He wants to know what is he doing which is so special so he's going to Jannah, right? So he goes to his house as a guest. Then one of the greatest things we can do is night prayer and fasting. Of course, he prays his five daily prayers in Ramadan. That's basic. But there has to be something extra. Why he is guaranteed paradise, not all of us. He says, I went the first night and I acted like I'm sleeping and I'm watching. Let's see how much this guy prays at night. He says, I didn't see him praying. He woke up just before Fajr. He prayed his few rakahs and witr, then they went for Fajr. He said, maybe he's going to fast. Watches him, the guy is not fasting, he's eating. Second day, he watches him, same thing. He's not praying at night a lot. Just a few rakahs, prays witr. Third night, he couldn't take it anymore. He says, Akhi, listen. I came here because this is what happened. We were sitting with the Prophet Sallallahu He said, a man of Jannah is going to enter, and you entered. Second day, he said, a man of paradise is entering. You entered. I wanted to find out the reason. And he said, Ah, it's like you saw. I don't pray a lot or fast a lot. He said, there has to be something. And he said to him, what? He said, I make sure. I don't sleep any night. Except that my heart is clean with everybody. I don't hold grudges. And I make sure when I meet a Muslim who has something better than me, I never envy them or become jealous. Two things. When Abdul, he listened to this Abdullah bin Umar, the son of Umar al-Khattabi, when he heard this, you know, he said what? He said, هَذَا الَّذِي مَا نَسْتَطِيعُ He said, this is what we cannot do. That is why you're going to Jannah. You can pray a lot, you can fast a lot, but cleansing your heart of that. I do not meet any Muslim except the what? If it's something better than me, clothes, car, wealth, whatever it is, I don't hold any jealousy. Say may Allah bless him. And when something happens between me and a Muslim, I don't go to sleep except that I make sure my register, my record is clean. My heart is clean. Ibn Umar said, this is what we do, cannot do. That is why you are going to Jannah. Point being, Yahwani, this Sahabi, we don't know his name. We don't know his name. And there's many others. You know the Sahabi who became Muslim, and he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they were about to go to fight. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam After they fought, he said to distribute the spoils, the war spoils. And he said, La, I did not become Muslim for this. I did not become Muslim for this. I became Muslim for what? So that I can serve the religion of Allah. So I can be shot by an arrow here, so it comes out from here. It was only a few days that exactly what he wanted ha happened to him. And the Prophet Sallallahu said what? Sadaqallahu fa sadaqahu. He was truthful with Allah, Allah was truthful with him. So we learn the seerah to love these great men. When you learn the seerah, when you get to the battle of Tabuk, Hunayn, before that, we get to Badr, before that, after that, you get to the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Before that, you learn about the daughters of the Prophet Sallallahu and you hear about a great man who the greatest man, the Prophet ﷺ, gives him his two daughters. One passes away, he gives him another of his daughter, marry her. The other passes away, he says, if I had a third daughter, I'll get her married to you. That man is great or not? So you learn how to cherish and honor that man. His name is Uthman ibn Affan. So you learn the seerah, you get to know this great man. Now, number six. Or oh, is that six? That was six? Yeah. Okay, what is seven? Proper tarbiyah. We said, what is the meaning of tarbiyah? Huh? Etiquette. In English, the best word is cultivation. Even though cultivation, we just use it normally for crops. Upbringing will be, will be very close. 
how to train someone and give them the right etiquettes from when they're young until they grow. That is tarbiyah in Arabic, upbringing, cultivating. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a Rabb. A Rabb. Why is Allah Rabb? Because He created you from nothing, and from nothing He made you something, and then until where you are today, He gave you everything. Allah is the one who cultivated you and brought you up until where you are. That is the meaning of Rabb. You get to learn the proper way of tarbiyah, upbringing, through the seerah of the Prophet. Number eight. What is number eight, Ikhwani? How to build a great personality, a great family, and a great society. We learn the seerah, the life of the Prophet ﷺ, to understand and to know the proper way of how to bring up and cultivate a proper personality, a good personality, meaning individuals. And individuals, they make up what? A family. And a family and a family and a family makes what? A society. We can only learn that from the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And we learn that very soon, insha'Allah. That is why, I'll touch this now. That is why whenever you see a book of Sirah, how many of you have read any book of Sirah? If you have read, or maybe you listened to lectures of Sirah before. Put your hands up so I can know. Okay, good number. What is the first thing they start to talk about usually? No. That's rare. Ahsant. The society and the state of the Arabs before Islam. That is very important. When you know that, you'll appreciate the work which was done by the Prophet ﷺ. You'll appreciate the seerah. How this man, through the tawfiq of Allah, through the facilitation of Allah, he took people who are rogue. Like rogue, like uncivilized if you want to call it like that uncultured evil ignorant people into the greatest society the world has ever seen and before that into the greatest families the world has ever seen and before that the building block which is what the greatest individuals So we learn the sirah for that. Number nine. The reasons for victory and majesty. And the reasons for humiliation. We learn that through the sirah of the Prophet Asbab al-Nasr wal-Majd wa asbab al hazima what are the reasons which bring victory and majesty and honor back to the Muslims? And what are the reasons which bring back or will keep the humiliation which is on the Muslims? The humiliation and the defeat and the defeatist mentality. When you learn the Sirah, you get to know that. Number 10. Naam. Ahsan. The seerah is the scale. The scale for what? Huh? It's the scale for your belief and your actions. Any religion consists of two parts. Belief systems in the heart and actions. Your beliefs, my beliefs. Your actions, my actions, which are of the religion. Remember we said what? We mentioned this last week. Eh? Of the religion. Not worldly affairs. How to make a microphone, we're not talking about that. The beliefs and the actions which are supposed to be the religion. They have to be weighed against the scale. 
What is the scale? The seerah, the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, the way of the Prophet. If they conform with it, if they agree with it, you do what we say? Huh? You put a check mark and you say, yes, this is good. If not, you leave that action. That is what the Prophet وسلم, said what? Man amila amalan laysa alayhi amruna fahuwa rad. Whoever does an action which I have not commanded, I did not do, it will be rejected. And we said that is in what? The religion, not the worldly affairs. Why did you say that? Did you give an example for that? Did we? Not. Yes? No. A, nay. What? Did we yes or not? We didn't. The Prophet وسلم, one day he was passing by one of the Ansar. Who are the Ansar? The inhabitants of Medina who welcomed the people from Mecca and other cities. They're called the helpers, the Ansar. And they used to cultivate dead palms. Debts. They grow debts. And usually debts, there's something called, you can call it cross planting or you can call it grafting. You cut one kind of a date. There's a male and a female, by the way, if you didn't know. And you join them together and you bring up a proper hybrid fruit. So he saw them doing this, some t certain types of dates, and he said, I don't think this is good. Meaning this type, I don't think is good. And he was passing by, the Prophet ﷺ is passing by. So he went by his way. They did their thing. How long do dates take to give their fruits? Hmm? When? How long? Around a year? The year comes about, no fruit, no produce, bad produce. They come back to the Prophet ﷺ to complain. They said, oh Messenger of Allah, you know that day you passed by and we were doing our thing and you said, I don't think this is good. He said, Antum adra bi umur dunyakum. You know your worldly affairs better than me. I just said, I think it's not good. I'm not a farmer. I'm not a farmer. It's just an opinion. That's not the religion, you understand? That's worldly affairs. Worldly affairs, you don't have to bring it back to the sunnah of the Prophet Because you won't find that. You understand? Worldly affairs, they're general. But things in the religion, it's supposed to get you close to Allah, get you close to paradise, Jannah, and take you from the halfa. It has to be brought back to the, the scale. Now, and what is number 11? To increase our iman. This is very important. We learn the seerah of the Prophet wasallam. Maybe one day we can shed tears. You see the hardships they went through. You see the sacrifice they put in. It increases your iman. It does. It increases our iman. Yes, and number 12. How to balance between the dunya and the deen. How to balance between being a good Muslim and being a good, productive Canadian. How do you balance between being a good father and being a good Muslim who wants to study his deen? How do you balance about being a student of knowledge who wants to seek knowledge and being a good husband? How do you balance between being a mother who has to do all the great things and being a good Muslimah who is getting close to Allah? You can only find that through the way the Prophet ﷺ, he lived and his companions. We said this, I'm saying this again. Because before we started the seerah, what were we learning before? Surah Al-Kahf. And the last verse of Surah Al-Kahf, just before the last verse, he says what? Say, I am a human being like you. That verse is important. The Prophet ﷺ was a human being like me and you. He had to juggle his worldly affairs, his family, and the greatest job any human being has ever been given. 
Nobody has been given the task he was given, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He had to preach to the whole world. All the other prophets, they preached to their people. That's it. That's it. Their people. That's it. He was given a task to spread the message across the globe. It's not an easy task. So how do you balance between that? And you say the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how many wives when he died? Nine. Miskin aunt, you have one and you have gray hair already. Sheikh, how can I get married to a second one? Allah? I don't think, I think I'll become too old too fast. What am I supposed to say to you? Slow down time. What am I supposed to say to you? You have to learn your deen. When you learn your deen, you know how to balance things. You know how to balance things. And you gave the example of what? Umar, radiallahu anhu, and his friend, the Ansari. He says what? Kunna natanawab. I will go to walk one day, and my neighbor, he will go to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa and sit with him all day and learn from the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa In the evening when I come back home from work, because I have to feed my family. And he will come back from the Prophet ﷺ. So he will teach me what he learned today. Tomorrow, he goes to work because he has a family to feed. And I go to the Prophet ﷺ all day to learn. When I come back in the evening and he comes back from work, I tell him what I learned. They balanced between the deen and the dunya. The day the Prophet ﷺ died, Abu Bakr was not in Medina, in central Medina. He was outside somewhere looking after his businesses. He used to be a businessman. He had to earn a living. How do you balance? We learned that through the seerah. Did we name num number 13? Oh, that was only 12. 12? Okay. So, so those of you who missed last week, that was the recap. And like we said, those of you wondering why we do this, we said we're here to study. We're here to study. We're not here to waste time. So we'll make sure we review all the classes we do. We'll make sure we take down notes. We'll make sure we learn the theory of the Prophet Wasallam. You don't just listen, you learn. We're here to learn about the seerah. I have no problems doing this for two years or one year. And I'm sure it's going to take around a year to cover the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. Because we'll be stopping at every major event and explaining what we learn and what we can practice in our lives today. Now before starting today, today's class meaning, what are the sources of the seerah now? Where do we get this seerah from? Once we have known its importance, where do we get it? There's four main sources. Four main sources. Number one is the Quran. And some of us may not have thought of this, but the Quran has a lot of the seerah. There's quite a few places, a few events which are mentioned in the Quran. So number one is the Quran. Give me examples before we go to number two. Give me examples. Surah Al-Duha. But the surah doesn't tell you that. That's the explanation of the surah. Surah Al-Anfal, Ahsant. Surah Al-Anfal, what does it tell you about? What event? The Battle of Badr. That's a very good example. Surah Al-Anfal, it tells you about Badr, it tells you, in fact, the strategy of the war, in fact, who was placed where, what happened, how the Sahaba, they were falling as Allah sent rain down to them, all of that. Good. Another example, Surah Al-Ahzab. Surah Al-Ahzab is talking about the battle of the Ahzab. Ahzab are the confederates, the various groups who gathered together, came together to attack the Muslims in Medina. The Jews, 
the polytheist Arabs, the Bedouins, they said, let's come together, go to Medina and finish off these Muslims. There's no need of meeting someone fighting. No, this time we go, we kill everybody, men, women, children, let's go kill them. And they surrounded Medina for how many days? How many days? 28 or 40? That's your homework for today. They surrounded Medina. They laid it under siege. That surah tells you about that event. That surah tells you about that event. Another example. Surah Al-Hashr. It tells you about what? It's either you know or you don't know. There's no I think. Either you know or you don't know. Hmm? The battle of Khaybar, Ijla of which tribe of the Jews, meaning the exodus of which tribe of the Jews. And this was right after, by the way, what? Ahzab. Because they had a treaty with the Prophet ﷺ, but then they what? They betrayed the Prophet ﷺ and they joined the confederates to fight the Prophet. So when those ones, they left, Allah sent them a wind. The Prophet ﷺ said, now we go to them because they broke the treaty. What tribe was that? Qaynuqa, Banu Nadir, Banu Mustaliq, Banu Quraidha. These are tribes of the Jews. Very good. Another example of the seerah. Surah Abasa. Ahsant. Surah Abasa. Abasa wa tawalla an jaahu al-a'ma. He frowned and he turned away when the blind man came to him. <coughs> and this is one of the early events. In fact, this is in Makkah now. This is in Makkah. Now, very good. Another one? Surah Al-Fatih. Very good. Al-Fatih, which is talk about which event? The Treaty of Al-Hudaybiyah. So, we learn the seerah through the Quran. Very good examples. Number two from the sources of the seerah is the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, which we say the Hadith. The Hadith. All of the major books of hadith, they contain a great deal of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, the sunnah is the seerah, like we said. When he tells you this is how the Prophet ﷺ used to walk, this is how he used to sleep, that is the seerah. So you find al-Bukhari, what are the eight or nine major books of hadith? Who can name them? Who can name all of them together? And you'll get a gift. The nine major books, Af Af ten major books of hadith. You have to know this. We are Muslims. Where do we get our religion? Wikipedia? Google? Where? We have sources. Don't forget this one. These things are very important. People are working hard day and night to take us away from our sources. So you don't know where you, you get the religion. I'm not saying, do you, have you ever read Bukhari and Muslim and whatever? Do you even know the names of the books? If you don't know, you listen carefully. The ten major books of hadith. If you can name all of them, you get a gift. If you name more than ten, you get the same gift. <laughs> yes. Al Bukhari. Bukhari. Muslim. Muslim. And those are the Afwan. Those are the two greatest books. Authentic. Everything you find in them is authentic. Very good. Okay. Number three. At Tirmidhi. At Tirmidhi. This is by. This is by the way with no proper order. Whatever comes after, there's no actual order. It's just books. The book of At-Tirmidhi. An-Nasai. Uh -huh. Ibn Majah. The book of Ibn Majah. Those are what? Those are five you've mentioned. Uh -huh. No, let him, let him speak. It's him. The Muat of Malik. Musnad of Ahmad. And he said, Mustadrak, even though I didn't plan on including on the 10, but okay, Mustadrak of Al-Hakim. Uh -huh. That is eight. Sunan Abu Dawood, they took away your gift. Sunan Abu Dawood. Sunan of Ad-Darimi. Those are 10. Sunan of Ad-Daraqutni, that is 11. Sunan Al-Kubra of Al-Bayhaqi. That is 11. Shamail, not really. Shamail is a compilation of the, from the other books. 
the Sahih of Ibn Hibban, that is number 12. All of these Ikhwani books which are sources of the Sunnah, the sources of our religion. You have to know these names. And whatever names you had right now, these are all the people who compiled these books. So the book is named after the author. That way is easy. So Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, At-Tirmidhi, An-Nasai, Ibn Majah, those are known as the six great books. Even though there's always differing, which is the sixth? Ibn Majah, or some of them include Ad-Darimi, Sunnah of Ad-Darimi, which is another great book. Then you have the Muat of Malik. Muat of Malik, you have the Musnad of Ahmad. And then you have the Sunnah Al-Kubra of Al-Bayhaqi. And then you have the Sahih of Ibn Hibban. And then you have the Mustadrak of Al-Hakim. These are some of the major sources of the Sunnah. There's a lot of Sirah in there. And in fact, it's rare to find any of these books which doesn't have a specific chapter of the Sirah. Naam. So that is the second source of the Sirah. Um, number three. What is the third source of the seerah? It's the actual books written on the seerah. Specific books written just on the seerah. Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, Mustadrak, Al-Haki, Muslim of Ahmad, Muat of Malik, and what, on, what not. They contain the whole religion. Fiqh of Tahara, Salah, Zakah, Hajj, and then they have a section of seerah. The specific books written just for seerah. From the Sahaba, there are those who wrote, like Ibn Abbas, he used to write the Sirah specifically. From the Tabi'een, the Tabi'een are the second generation. They used to write, they used to write, sorry, Wahb ibn Nabih, Sa'id al Musayyib. You don't have to know all these names when they are books, we don't have to, but this is important to know. The most famous books of the Sirah, I'll mention them. You have the Sirah of Ibn Hisham. The Seerah of Ibn Hisham. And this book was summarized by Ibn Ishaq. Muhammad Ibn Ishaq. He summarized the book of Ibn Hisham. The book called Seerah al Rasul. Okay, that is one of the main, if not the main book of Seerah. Then you have the book Al Maghazi of Al Waqidi. Of Al Waqidi. Al-Maghazi of Al-Waqidi. And then you have Tabaqat Al-Kubra of Ibn Sa'ad. Muhammad Ibn Sa'ad. And Ibn Sa'ad used to be the writer of Al-Waqidi. He used to be like his student. Ibn Sa'ad used to be the student and the writer of Al-Waqidi. Ibn Sa'ad has a great book called Tabaqat Al-Kubra. He compiled the, uh, the, the biographies of people. The first chapters of the book are in the seerah of the Prophet After that we have Tariq Jami'u Tariq Al-Muluk Ar-Rusul Al-Muluk If I'm not wrong that's the name of the book Famously known as Tariq Al-Tabari Tariq Al-Tabari The book of Imam Ibn Jarir Al-Tabari he has a very good section on the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. No, this is tarikh of At-Tabari. He wrote the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ and then the whatever happened after that, until his time. Then you have same concept, Al-Bidaya wa Nihaya of Ibn Kathir. Al-Bidaya wa Nihaya, which is the same concept. He wrote the stories of the Prophets until the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then whatever happened until his time. Ibn Kathir, famous writer of the Tafsir. And I think that has been printed by Darus Salaam in English. His version of the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there's other books, you know, this is what comes into my mind right now in summary. And number four from the sources of the seerah, where do we learn the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? are the books of, actually it should be five. So number four will be the books of Shama'il. 
Shama'il means characteristic, description. We have books which are called Shama'il Muhammadiyah, the description or the characteristic of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Two years ago, we did the winter conference here and we went through the Shama'il of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's books where they physically describe the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then his manners, his daily routine. The books of Shama'il. The most famous one, of course, is the book of At-Tirmidhi. Shama'il, Muhammadi of At-Tirmidhi. And then there's Shama'il of Ibn Kathir, which they say he summarized the book of At-Tirmidhi. Allahu A'la. And there's others, I'm just mentioning what comes to mind. And number five are the books of Dala'il an nubuwa Dala'il an nubuwa which, which we can say in English actually is the signs of prophethood. The signs of prophethood. These are specific books, the scholars they wrote, compiling the hadith or the narrations which prove that the Prophet Muhammad was the real prophet. So they don't write the whole seerah, no. They write the specific events or descriptions of things which prove that you cannot deny he was a real prophet. So you'll find most of the miracles there and things which happened which he prophesied and then they happened which nobody can know except a true prophet. Dala'il and Nubuwa. And the, the most famous one is the book of, who knows, the most famous book of Dala'il. The book of Al-Bayhaqi. And it was summarized and cleansed to simple authentic narrations only by um, the daughter of Sheikh Muqbil ibn Hadi Al-Wadi'i rahimahullah is the daughter of the Sheikh himself the famous muhaddith of Yemen of our time uh, they did Suhih Musnad fi Dala'il Nubuwa the authentic compilation of the Dala'il al Nubuwa so these are the five main sources in learning the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam now we'll stop here pray Salat al-Isha and then describe the setting for the seerah. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik shadun la ilaha ilaha anta astaghfiruka tawbalik. Al-Qibu salam.